was born James Langston Hughes, February 1st, 1902, in Joplin, Missouri. And he wasn't there very long, went on to Lawrence, Kansas, which is where he spent a lot of his boyhood, most of his boyhood. One of the things that attracted me to Langston was the difficulty he had as a child um, because his parents were divorced and because their marriage had been a really rocky one. He was tossed about from one parent to the other, from Cleveland to Mexico. He also spent a lot of time in Lawrence, Kansas with his aunt and uncle. Could you tell us something about uh, Langston Hughes' early life? Uh, what was his life like as a child? Langston lost his father, uh, to all intents and purposes, uh, when he was quite young. His father left the family, uh, being unable to make a, a living as uh, an attorney, which is what he wanted to be, unable to practice law because of the color of his skin. He went off first to Cuba and then to Mexico. So Langston really didn't know his father, except really as a kind of absence in his life, which was very hurtful. The other connection I felt reading him was that he had to have spent a lot of time alone, um, recuperating from some of the stresses of being in this particular family. He connected with uh, nature. In fact, I recently was there and saw the river that runs through Lawrence that I understood that Langston had loved and had spent a good deal of time uh, looking at and, and feeling. So I think that actually he was supported by nature uh, when he could not feel supported by his parents. He grew up uh, mainly with his grandmother, uh, Mary Langston, his mother's uh, mother, in Lawrence, Kansas. And that, I think, is where uh, his consciousness, so to speak, was formed. What I love about the story of Langston and his grandmother uh, is that she reminded him uh, that his ancestors had fought against being enslaved, that they had not accepted it, and that his um, direct ancestor, his grandfather, Sheridan Leary, had really um, fought with, with John Brown against the institution of slavery. Langston was definitely uh, from a distinguished family. His grandmother's, his mother's mother's first husband, uh, died at Harpers Ferry fighting in John Brown's uh, band. Mm -hmm. And uh, her second husband was also a prominent abolitionist. Uh, and his brother, this is Charles Langston, Langston's grandfather, uh, Charles Langston's brother was perhaps one of the three best-known African-Americans of the 19th century, a congressman uh, from Virginia and also an ambassador to Haiti and the Dominican Republic and so on. So he had this extremely distinguished background, Langston Hughes did, except that uh, he, his family was poor. Um, by the time he was growing up, they were almost destitute at times, uh, and this had a profound effect upon his, um, his, his, his sense of, of who he was. I understand his grandmother died when he was about 12, 13 years old. Yes, Langston's grandmother died in his very early teens um, when he was uh, 13 or thereabouts. Um, <clears throat> and that, too, um, affected him, I think, quite strongly um, because although um, she was often silent uh, and, um, and perhaps uh, not forthcoming in her love for him, uh, she was still an important uh, guiding figure. And it was then, at that point, that I think uh, he spent several months with the, with the Reeds, uh, who had a profound effect, I think, on his, um, uh, on his sense of, uh, of, um, of his identity. Uh, the Reeds did not have children. Uh, they were a different kind of people altogether. She uh, was prominent in the local church. Uh, he did not go to church, but uh, he enjoyed life. Um, and they had a good time together. The Reeds showered love affection, encouragement on young Langston, and he absolutely basked in it. He really needed it. Keep reading them books. Why do you think religion was so important to uh, Auntie Reed? All day long, sinners coming to Christ. And I think that even when I was growing up uh, in, in a similar little town, well, actually not a little town, but way out in the country, uh, people really wanted us to be saved. It was important. It's very important to uh, religious communities, especially uh, black Southern Christian ones, that the children be, quote, saved. And so um, she was doing it because she loved him and because she wanted him to feel in himself 
um, some kind of protection, some kind of uh, uh, supernatural protection, because the life of a black child then is now was in jeopardy uh, with every breath. So she felt that if you had Jesus to protect you, then you, you were saved. Her uh, religion, I think, was a much more fundamentalist kind of religion, a much more ecstatic kind of religion. Um, and I think it impressed him tremendously. Uh, the cries, the, 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 the singing, the promise of, uh, of um, a kind of immediacy uh, in the intervention of, uh, of God. This he didn't have in his, in his uh, I think, in his mother's religion. Um, so he found it, I think, very, very compelling. Was Langston damaged by this church experience? Uh, I, I don't think he was damaged. I think it was a great awakening. It, it was an awakening to the fact that other people uh, think of your salvation quite differently from the way you think of your salvation. We do know that, uh, that Langston had a severe view of religion. Um, he admired uh, the place of religion and recognized the place of religion in the black world, in the black community. Um, he admired the faith of, uh, of say, older uh, black women or men, um, but for, for he, he himself was not a believer. And, um, and he was also very um, angry about religious hypocrisy. His salvation, he was saved. He was saved from that kind of delusion that there is, in fact, a Jesus who's going to come to the bench, take you by the Because it's all literal. You know, it's, right. when I went to the Soviet Union, I, I had just gotten out of um, my freshman year at school. And I had been told so many times that there was an iron curtain you know, right, right. that I, and, and I, to me it was completely literal. And so when I actually got to the border between the Soviet Union and Finland and the train stopped, I went out to see the Iron Curtain. Wow. <laughs> and what an awakening. Right. What an awakening. I, I said, you know, this is a delusion. You know, this is a lie. There is no Iron Curtain here. And to top it off, all of the Russian um, soldiers who, who came out to search the train or whatever were very kind. They were much better than the police I had left in Georgia. Where was Jesus? Where was he? Where was this light I was supposed to see? Why won't this boy come? What was I supposed to do? Pretend like Wesley? How, how did uh, Langston feel about Jesus failing him? Uh, we don't know for an absolute fact that this happened exactly the way it happened uh, in Langston's life. But it is a powerful scene, and, and it meant a great deal to Hughes, and he embedded it, in his embedded it in his autobiography early on so that we could get a sense of some important things about him. Um, uh, and I think he wanted to make a statement about his, his father, his parents, um, because they are sort of absent from the scene, with the Reeds being present. Um, it's a tribute to Auntie Reed, really, um, in, in many respects, and to Uncle Reed. Um, but of course, it is, above all, a picture of a boy uh, in, in a state of desolation. The chapter called Salvation in the Big Sea is often identified as a very uh, a piece of good writing, that it was the prose was especially well-conceived. Could you talk about that? Hughes's style in the autobiography, I think, is to offer us a succession of vignettes, um, little tales. Um, and this one, I think, is a beautifully rounded uh, little tale. I think it deals, as Hughes so often does, it deals with something that's profound, something that's extraordinarily sad, but it is treated in a light-hearted way. And that was the essence of Hughes. I mean, he connects uh, that uh, aspect of his aesthetic to the blues. Uh, the blues is about uh, sad uh, events, but when they are sung, he says, people laugh. Uh, and both of them, the this, this, this singing or the playing and the laughter, amount to a real victory over the sadness. Um, so that's part of the structuring of, of the story. What I love to point out to people, too, is the absolute beauty of Hughes's prose uh, in, in its simplicity. It is, I think, uh, the most fundamentally American kind of prose uh, you, can, you can get. There's no pretense whatsoever, no use of high Latinate phrases, no turns 
and twists of expressions, no cuteness, no smartness. It is direct, it is clear, pelucid, honest, and therefore, uh, or maybe it's too much of a compliment, but I think it's very American then, in the sense of Whitman and Hemingway uh, also having the same desire to write a kind of clear prose uh, that they believe is un-European and is peculiarly American. Do you think you could uh, address how did he become a writer? What, was that a choice easily made or difficult for him? Or? Well, he himself in, in the Big C, uh, he used as, uh, talks about uh, reading the uh, French writer Guy de Maupassant in French and struggling with it as a schoolboy. And then one day um, he is reading um, de Maupassant and it is snowing in the text. And then it begins to snow outside his window. And suddenly he was be able to understand the French and enter into the beauty of the writing. And he says that there and then he decided that he would become a writer like de Maupassant because he recognized this sort of power of, uh, of writing to, to preserve an age and to speak for a situation and sometimes to speak for a people. And he said that there and then he decided that he would be a writer and write about African Americans, uh, stories that people would re and poems that people would remember generations hence. Books were around him all the time. Um, he talks about the library, loving the library in Topeka and also in Lawrence. Um, so I think it wasn't a far stretch for him to, um, to become a writer. Hughes did not want to use words as weapons. And he also, while he was a radical at certain points in his life, he, he believed in art, and that was uh, his identity, really, his public identity from beginning to end, an artist. The Harlem Renaissance is something that I think uh, people are very interested in what it was. Uh, could you talk about that a little bit? Uh, as I understand the Harlem Renaissance, it was a time when uh, African American writers and artists and musicians flourished. And not only that, Harlem itself was wonderful. It's hard to believe, you know, that Harlem was this thriving, safe, beautiful, actively uh, engaged community of very uh, lively, happy people, for the most part. Um, and so, of course, art flourished there because there was so much life. In, in 1926, Hughes published an essay called The Negro Artist on the Racial Mountain in, a, in the very prestigious Nation magazine. Uh, and, it, and that stands as a kind of manifesto for the Harlem Renaissance. It emphasizes, one, uh, that the younger writers had um, a sense of, uh, of, uh, of themselves, a sense of identity uh, that was distinct from the older writers, the old African-American writers. Uh, the younger writers believed in, I would say, two things above all as far as Hughes was concerned. Uh, they believed in racial identification to some extent, and they also believed in freedom. Uh, freedom from worrying about what uh, um, what middle class people thought about their work or, or white people thought of their work or religious people thought of their work. So there was this emphasis on race and on freedom and Hughes stressed both. I think that's why so much art came out of that period. People, black people, were having uh, their first uh, taste of any kind of freedom and autonomy in the country. Langston Hughes more than articulated the needs of uh, African-American people. Uh, as an artist, he did more than that. He showed them what they looked like while they were artic articulating their needs and concerns. And he showed them you know, what was not such a good face to present and what was uh, a very good face, you know. Uh, and he showed them, you know that poem by um, County Cullen about uh, how African Americans are often required to have two faces? Yes, we wear the know? mask. And, um, and I think Langston's work showed them what it meant uh, to try to keep the mask off, you know, because if you have two faces, one is often a mask. And so his work, he worked very hard to say to black people, you don't have to wear the mask at all, just the way you are, it's just fine. And that's a lovely thing, especially in those times. In that sense, he was uh, an artist of, of the highest caliber. In a way, what it is that I, I respect so much about his work is his devotion. He had enough faith in himself. I mean, I think he knew that some of his poetry was kind of not so terrific, but what he really 
believed in was leaving um, this body of work that would actually say to people many years later, you know, a century or two later, uh, this was a particular community. They struggled on to, you know, to have a good life uh, in the middle of some incredible uh, repression. And, th and this is the beauty, and this is the humor, and this is the joy, and this is, this is what they created. You can find, you, if you read all of his work, uh, like Zora Neale Hurston, you can find a complete community. And that is very unusual. Hughes had a, a, a tremendous sense of devotion to the word, a sense of duty as an artist, obligation to his craft, obligation to his audience. It's something, it's one of the most spectacular stories, really, in African American and perhaps even in American literature. Mm -hmm. uh, he was the first African American to live by his or her writings. And, um, and, and he did so sometimes at enormous personal cost to himself. But he kept going because um, he believed that uh, any kind of dilution of his, of his energies away from writing um, uh, would, be, would, not, would not be uh, true to, you know, to his sense of duty. I understand that Langston wrote most often when he was the most unhappy, that it came out of his unhappiness. Well, it was a famous British poet, I think it was Shelley, who said, our sweetest songs are those which t tell of saddest thought. Uh, so I think the idea is out there always that there is this association between sadness and creativity, between pain and creativity. I think for writers, stress can be a great friend and sadness can be a very, very great friend. It's because when you are sad, you go to deeper parts of yourself and to, into hidden chambers. And Langston had many of those. And uh, I think because his childhood was so fractured uh, because his father basically rejected him uh, and because his mother never understood really that he, he was a writer but and he wrote books but he didn't have much money and she was always you know very much in need. Uh, Hughes is a difficult person to talk about in this way because uh, he put such an emphasis on laughter on smiling through um, but he does tell us at a certain point that, that he could write poetry when he was sad he was not able to write poetry uh, when he was happy. Uh, this could be true or could be sometimes true of him, I don't know. Um, but he had sufficient sadness in his life. And I think he was often misunderstood. I think when he went off into um, politics, for instance, uh, and especially he was very much in favor of communism as he experienced it in the Soviet Union. Well, that didn't play well here. Uh, even though anyone looking at his background could clearly understand why if he went to a country where they treated him like a human being, you know, he would be enchanted. The important thing for him always was to triumph over that sadness. Um, he used it to create. Um, he used his sense of, uh, of social oppression and deprivation to create a certain kind of poetry. Uh, he used the kind of cosmic sense of existential sense of pain, that which he also had, that had nothing to do with, with race or politics in a way to create another kind of poetry. Um, but as I keep saying, you know, the end with Hughes always is to affirm the human, and, and that's what his, his body of work does above all, I think. I understand that he helped other writers on the way up and brought them into the fold of African-American literature. He was very concerned about, about that. Yes, as, as soon as Hughes was able to uh, be of any assistance to, to younger writers, um, he certainly did his best to encourage them. I mean, if one looks at the career of uh, a great poet um, such as um, Gwendolyn Brooks, uh, you find him helping her in her in her teens and maintaining this connection with her for the rest of uh, of his life. Uh, or Margaret Walker, who in 1942 won the Yale Younger Poets Prize. Uh, Hughes knew her too as a teenager. Uh, set aside time to work with her. Um, encouraged her. When I um, went to visit Langston right. Hughes in Harlem, and it was a very different Harlem, though he continued to love it, I think just the same, which again is, is, is that devotion that he had. Uh, he was living in um, a townhouse, it seemed to be a townhouse, that he shared with uh, friends or relatives, I, I didn't know. And his own space seemed very modest 
And uh, all I remember really is that when he asked me which of his books I liked, um, very honestly, I said I haven't read a single one. And he never missed a beat. He just reached behind him, <laughs> as if he'd done this many times, to a cabinet and then turned around and took out copies of, you know, everything he'd written, put them in my arms. And um, I thought, there are not many people with that kind of grace. You know, once you tell them that you haven't read anything, right. you don't know anything, who are they, you know, why am I here? You know, but he was very graceful. And uh, I really appreciated. I was really young, and he could have said things that were very hurtful, but he didn't. He was he was wonderful. Here we are in a new century, 21st century. Langston has become so popular; he's on a postage stamp. Uh, what do you think that tells us about his place in uh, African American literature and American literature as a whole uh, in today's world? I think he has a lot to say to Americans. Um, and to other peoples, for that matter, about about life and about poetry, about art. Um, uh, whether or not he will continue to be, his work will continue to be respected, um, as always, um, depends on the people who who admire him and admire his work. His literature, of course, is priceless. You know, that's a given. You, you may not like this, or you like that, or you know, pick and choose because there's so much. I mean, he. He worked in many genres. Everyone's uh, s eventual success, uh, fame, uh, is dependent on uh, you know teachers and uh, parents uh, passing on the word to younger people uh, that here is a body of work that is uh, you know worth looking at. So, but at the moment, uh, teachers I think are very fond of Langston Hughes. His poetry communicates. Uh, very well uh, to younger people, very young people. Um, there's a great body of work uh, that he left behind. There's something to please, if not everyone, well, many people. Um, so I think that, that, um, that his work is likely to endure insofar as we could look ahead. Thank you, Dr. Rampasat, for spending your time with us and taking a moment to share Langston Hughes' life and what you know about him. Thank you so much. You're very welcome. When you really look at his life, there's also an ascetic side, uh, which, which meant that no matter what was happening, he was trying to uh, explore the meaning of life uh, in this country and for African Americans in particular, but not just them alone, you know, in particular, but not for them alone. Thank you so much, Alice Walker, for spending this time with us here today. And uh, we're very appreciative of your thoughts about Langston Hughes and uh, a little bit of the meaning behind his life. I love Langston, and it's my pleasure.